the show now. Come on. Bad black mama's gonna let you go now. Hey. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Now. Come on. Let's shoot ya. Let's shoot ya. Let's shoot ya. Hey, what's up? Let's shoot ya. Let's shoot ya. Come on. Let's shoot ya. Hey. And so this episode is um, Secrets of the Black Family. And this is um, Uncle. I changed the name from Curtis to Rufus because me and Ramel do know a Curtis, and it may they may get offended that we use their name. <laughs> but um, but we are talking about him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> Uncle I'm just Curtis, kidding. <laughs> Uncle Rufus. Well, there, in the there's basement. a Rufus out there too. Now. Yeah, it's a Rufus. Yeah, I had an uncle named Rufus. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> so, so. But he's no longer here, so right. Okay, <laughs> we're good. So, so this topic, just so we are all on the same page, you know, is really more of um, the stigma of how we all have some uncle or, and I would say uncle or close relative that has been locked away or is in our family, is in there and really hidden away in our households. And we are either, um, we know of them, we, we, the family don't share them. You know, we're going to discuss about the mental um, shame that goes along the, the, in the black family. And this has been prevalent in our families for years and years. I have one out that I'm going to speak about. You probably had three or four. Everybody has them because we have been groomed not to talk about them. You know, um, I don't know when we talk about them, why have we been taught not to talk about them? I just know that once I got to high school, other people were talking about their um, their family members who were challenged mentally, like it was just something normal. Well, we weren't allowed to even speak about them. We weren't even allowed to really be around them because different things that came along with them being mentally challenged or mentally ill. And I'm not just talking about your average person because I say average when because we all deal with anxiety, depression, and things like that in our day-to-day -day life. I'm talking about they may be severely bipolar. They may be schizophrenic, manic depressant. They, were, they um, are not functioning at all. You know what I mean? when I say not functioning, they cannot be set alone to take right, care of their right. self. So they are in a place where somebody is caring for them, a family member is caring for them, but they are um, kind of shut away from the rest of the world. And we are hush to even talk about them, but we know they down there and we can have dinners and we can have Thanksgiving and they may get the plate taken to their room. You know, <laughs> Y'all know them. I don't mean the last. I mean, y'all know the place to take to their room, and then they take the play. What, what was that movie? Yeah, um, yeah, it's very true. I mean, it's that's really, very true. The play was yeah, taken to their room. We get the yeah. play back, but they're in their room, and and life goes on. So that you know, was soul food. Soul food. What remember? Soul food. So um, I don't mean to. I don't mean to chuckle, Kimmy. I just thought about. I I know some family members that don't have mental issues. They just have some other issues, and they do the same thing. So. Uh, <laughs> But I won't go there tonight. Okay. Oh, wow. So you know we we're we're in the midst of the episode. So I mean, I'm, we can start and then and I'm looking at Ramel because Ramel looked like she wanted to say something and and me and her was going back and forth with this the other day and I was I thank her because this episode can get really deep and I say really deep because when we, I think about um, my family member that was shut away. I just remember my grandma, um, and Mel knows my grandma really well. She, she, she died many, many years ago, but my grandma was, um, and Jay, you know, grandma too, um, was really my heart and soul. And when I was growing up as a little girl, we had a family member and his name was Snooky. So you already know what a name like Snooky, something wasn't right. Mm. <laughs> so, um, you know, all I just knew that my grandma would prepare food for him and my grandma always um, loved to cook and cooking was her way of showing love but she just knew one thing when she brought the food to me to take to him he Kimmy drop it off at the door don't you go in there you just drop that off at the door and hurry up back well you know as a child you're very inquisitive you want to know what Snooky doing in there you know what I mean all <laughs> I knew that Snooky was very huge and I was just a little kid and he had on his underwear and the hairy chest. And I was like, I need to get away from that door. Cause um, she told me not to go in there. And I just wonder why nobody is letting him out to get some sunshine. Cause I just knew my grandma said, sunshine wow. make you feel well. And you are in this room 
and he's eating good food, but he's not coming outside, you know, but mm -hmm. we couldn't talk about him, but our day-to-day -day lives went on, but Snooky was in that room, and then as we got a little older, me and my brothers used to joke, like, maybe we'll do something, like, really jacked up and get Snooky upset, and he would bust out the room, you know what I mean, and my grandma was heard us joking about this, and she was like, "Don't you ever do that? And don't you go near that door? You know what I mean? Stay away from there." So, you know, this just yeah, an example yeah. that we knew something was wrong with Snooky, mm -hmm. and you know, even his mom was like, um, "You know, it was normal that Snooky was locked away." So that's just one of my things where we were taught not to have any kind of conversation outside of our family circle. But we wasn't messing with Snooky because Snooky was um, probably deemed dangerous, you know, in some aspect. And still to this day, I don't know how Snooky got into this place. Snooky is now going on to glory, but I don't know how Snooky got into this place. But Snooky was not deemed to come across that threshold of that door and come out at all. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, wow. that's um, that's a little unnerving, you know, because if you think about it, what happened if it went the opposite way and he did bust out or something happened? It could have went um, terribly wrong. But that's my story. But Mel, I know you have a lot to say. Well, let me ask a question real quick before we get started. It's Kimmy, JB, Ramel, and was there another person? Aisha. 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 Cousin named Aisha. Yeah, they wrote a song about it. They wrote a song about it. Aisha. Oh, okay. Who was that? Oh, uh, do addition. Oh, another oh, minute okay. creation. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I know it went platinum. And, and we're already we're already in the midst of it, Dr. Dexter. So we're just talking, you know. So formally we didn't introduce you, but before we get formally oh, into this, let's just, you know, step back a second and Dr. Dexter, just tell us a little bit about yourself for any everybody listening. Oh, I well, I was gonna dive right in. I just wanted to make sure um, who I was speaking with and who was actually on online. Well, I'm L. Micah Dexter. Uh, I pastor uh, uh, Salem Church, uh, Missionary Baptist Church in Syracuse, New York. My background is psychology, uh, forensic psychology and um, in law. Um, I was an insurance agent for a number of years and um, I, have a show that um, happens on Saturdays at 10.30 a.m. on point with El Micah and Louise. And so uh, uh, that's that's about it. I'm very real and um, some people can handle that and some people can't, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to this show tonight and uh, just glad to meet you all. And thank you for having me, Kimmy. You're welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. So, Ramel. So speaking of Uncle Rufus's in the basement, we had an Uncle Rufus when I was growing up, and he was not in the basement. He was right in the bedroom next door. Oh. And um, <laughs> it wasn't even a secret just outside of the household. It was a secret in the household. Like They didn't even talk about it among the people who lived in the house. So, you know, he comes downstairs with thumbtacks in his face and he walks through the kitchen and the, you know, you know how the Yorktown houses are set up. You come downstairs, you're in the living room. So he walks through the living room, the dining room, and there's like five adults. And I'm looking like, ain't nobody gonna say nothing about this thumbtacks <laughs> all over the man's face. And they and I, I mean, I was young, so I didn't say anything. So I went to my mother and I was like, What's what's going on? And she was like, Oh, you know, he's having an issue. Well, you know, he started trying to spray people with um, I don't I don't know if it was Lysol or something in the can some aerosol, and that's when they finally, what, you know, in Philly, we call it 302 mm -hmm. Um, And he spent some time in a mental institution, and but it was embarrassing because nobody ever talked about it. You know, I wasn't taught about uh, mental health issues. So because it seemed like a stigma because it was suppressed in the household, outside the household. Right. So I was embarrassed and I shouldn't even been embarrassed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's real. But I don't understand why Black people just don't talk about it even amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. right. Get that loved one a little help. Let's talk about that. Shame. Shame. Yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, this, this is really, it goes right in line with what I advocate is destigmatizing the conversation of mental health because that's yeah. the shame. Nobody talks about it. And we all have that experience. I had a family member, nobody would talk why they never come around for none of the holidays. 
Mm-hmm. Why was it such a hush hush? You know, they were kept at a distance, never around. You know, nobody told, you know, you couldn't mention her outside the family. That's how it was. Nobody wants to talk about the mental health, the real mental health issues within the family. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, you, you end up creating, especially when you're very young, you can't process that. You try to figure out why, why, why can I, you know, why does nobody want to, you know, some don't look right. Some don't feel right, you know, and, and, and that's very unfortunate. You know, I, I just distinctly remember hearing those words. You don't talk about nothing going on outside. You don't run, you don't tell nobody nothing about your auntie. You don't yeah. talk about her. You don't talk about that. And so that was something that, you know, you, you try to process that at a young age, but as you get older, you understand, okay, they are, they, they're ill right now. They're not a bad person. They're just yeah. ill. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not well. They're not well. But the fact that we have to suppress that, mm-hmm. that is that million dollar question. Why? Mm-hmm. Well, I Why can't we well, talk I, I about think, it? I think that the biggest problem um, going back to Shane J is what I, I think that goes back further than any of us around. I think that goes back to probably slavery days of being able to see who is the, um, I guess, the most healthiest and most able uh-huh. body person. So being able to hide the person that is not, you know, um, or the, the one that's the traumatized person is, is a survival mechanism, you know, um, I actually read up about this when I was in um, in school, um, in undergrad, that in in the psych um, in my psych class, that this is actually a, a way to protect yourself from being demonized. You know, well, as people of color, I, I, I think it's kind of foolish because you'll never get help if you don't outwardly talk about things that are hurting you, afflicting you. Um, or making you feel a certain type of way. And I know that you are um, definitely um, in that that realm of, or that profession now, but think about when you're not able to talk about it because you think people are going to judge you. You know, just get to make it simple. Right. People are going right. to judge you. You know, that's right. huge. I don't want to be judged by anybody. And I damn sure don't want to be judged because like, if I think about it, Mel, let's think about it. When we grew up in North Philly, you know what I mean? And um, the ghetto of North Philly, I don't want to be judged because I'm already in the lower, we may, may have thought we were living um, in the middle class, but we that really wasn't the middle class. We don't want to be the judged upper, by lower class. the lower class. You know what I mean? And now we got... We, <laughs> We got crazy Rufus in the house too, you know. So I don't want to be judged with with my crazy family member member in the house. I barely have anything, you know. I want to be considered one of the upper echelon people in the in the lower echelon. You you see what I'm saying? It's it's what people think, you know, of you. Where that shouldn't even be be a, a issue. That's that's what I think what goes on half of the time. It's the shame and how we can destigmatize it. I don't know, but. Um, it still goes on today. I think that we, we're starting to come to the table and talk about it more. Yes. But, um, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. But yes. I still think it's a lot of um, Rufus is hidden, you know, um, hidden in, in in the house somewhere. And because um, I can tell you for myself, I have, um, you know, my daughter is um, autistic and I outwardly talk about my daughter and the issues I have with my daughter and helping my daughter with challenges she has with um, anxiety and things like that. But I can tell you when I get around like my mom or something like that, my mom is still old school. My mom really doesn't want to have a conversation about that. So I could tell she probably looks at me in a different way. And like, you know, Kimmy, I really don't want you to be like outwardly talking about all this stuff with your daughter because, you know, but I don't really have to care about what anybody else thinks about my daughter because I love my daughter unconditionally and I'm going to take care of her, you know what I mean? And I'm going to make sure she has everything she needs. She's going to be the person um, fully functioning because I work with her, but I can tell my mom and we are in two separate, you know, categories as far as what people think. And that's huge. So if I was the same way, probably could end up, she could be in, in some room or something if I didn't tend to her. Because just for the simple fact that she's considered um, on the spectrum. And even though she's not high up on the spectrum, she still could be, you know, labeled. So um, I used to be, listen on you. Go ahead, Dr. Dexter. 
Oh, Aisha's getting ready to say something, go ahead. Okay, um, I was just gonna say, I think a part of the reason why uh, people don't really wanna talk about what's going on in their family because it brings awareness to the fact that they have no resolution. It's like, okay, so we're gonna talk about it, bring up all of these issues, but you know, we have no resources, no skills or nothing to change the situation. So at times it becomes hurtful to, you know, dig it all up because it almost feels like, well, for what now? What do we do now? We didn't talk about Uncle Rufus, but he's still going to be in the basement doing all the crazy stuff that everybody knows he's been doing. Like, what are we going to do with it now? And I think that lack of help and resources is a part of the reason why it's just a little easier for some people so they think to kind of tuck it away and just not say you know not say or do anything um i know in my family our situation was a little bit different it wasn't necessarily mental health um it was drugs i only have one by i had one biological uncle and um he was an incredible musician he played with some famous folks but you know coming up in the 60s and 70s the drugs just kind of took him out so same situation he was upstairs in you know grandma's house in the room the door is locked you know just check on him or whatever put the plate outside and you hurry up and come back down and we would see him occasionally when he wasn't strung out he was you know a great individual but there were you know more times than i can count that you know he was just you know to be kind of tucked away and nobody wanted to you know talk about um him or anything that had to do with him and i'm grateful that my mom you know she she was a different type of person. She was the, we gonna talk about it. You gonna hear all this from me, not out there. You know, I don't want the streets telling my kids anything. So from a very, very young age, she talked a lot about, um, a lot about, um, you know, his struggle with drugs and, you know, all of those things. Um, and it's really funny. Like, it's easy to talk about somebody else's stuff um, than it is your own. We, I have um, a sister who has some mental health challenges and we still haven't gotten to the core of, all that was going on with her um but my mom again this is why i said usually it's that lack of resources there wasn't so much that she could do she really didn't know what to do or how to help so she just kind of you know did the best she could and you know washed her hands of it and even still some things you know are just excused to oh well that's just how she is or whatever the case may be she's made tons of apologies now going i wish i would have you know fought harder for her i applaud you kimmy for saying you know everything you said about your daughter um because you know it's our, our responsibility as these family members you know to you know Know, to get the help that we need for those individuals so that we can talk about how to make sure they are functioning at the highest that their highest level of ability and capability um so i love the conversations that we're having now so that people can see like it's not just me it's not mm -hmm. just my family right. okay well this is something that this person or on a podcast said helped them let me just try this let me see what resources i can get my hands on so people are not feeling like they have to suffer in silence or these are conversations that we shouldn't be talking about these are conversations that we should have been having hundreds of years ago so that we wouldn't be in the situations that we're in now so hopefully you know individuals listening they can you know take bits and pieces out of all of this and just know that you know the time is over for feeling like you have to suffer in silence and these are conversations that you know people are gonna you know judge you negatively for these are our family members we have to take care of them and we have to do better mm -hmm. so dr Dexter, yeah your thoughts yeah so mine may sound a little convoluted but um i, I plan to, to detangle it as much as possible um i've heard a lot of information in uh, a, a lot of areas. And I must say, before I get started, my Uncle Rufus was just my Uncle Rufus. He was my grandfather's uh, uh, brother. <laughs> he was upstairs over the barber shop um, that we own. But uh, he was just Uncle Rufus. He had some, some crazy stories that went on, but he wasn't one that we kept hid. So just in case so many family members are, are watching, I'm not saying Uncle <laughs> Rufus had some issues. You know, I know that he stole the chicken for his girlfriend, the impressive <laughs> back in the early 1900s. But um, you know, uh, you know, so listen, we're all a step or 24 hours away from a mental breakdown. And the reason why I say that is that when we talk about people that are hidden because of stachomas and, and not recognizing what uh, issue actually really is and accepting the dynamics that's placed before us, 
we often shuffle someone over to a room. We go through things every day in our lives. So if that person that we're hiding away could be us in a matter of 24 hours, depending on what your life is like, mm -hmm. all right? And so we have to constantly, I know I have to pray every day, you know, just to, and I don't mean to quote a song or anything, but just to make it today, but I have to pray every day in order to stay sane. Because with life, I don't know about you, I mean, I, I, I came from a foster home, a foster home, and then my grandparents finally took me in. So I should have been at Uncle Rufus or Uncle whoever uh, just lost, but I had to take reins and take control and ask God to, to, to lead me. So in saying all of that, we have to make sure that when we're pointing fingers at people, um, or not we per se, but people in, in general, and saying, oh, that person's acting like that, or that person has this issue, or they're being slid food or whatever. You, you don't know what tragedy that person has gone through, or if it's a mental issue, or if it's just a devastating situation that's happened in their life and they're having a difficult time trying to overcome it. That's why it's better to be kind to someone that you meet coming uh, and going out than to be rude to someone because you never know what someone might be going through. Mm -hmm. And saying that, um, you know, I, I don't have any autistic children and I, I, I can't say that I, I could say that all my children are great. They have issues and whatever uh, in, in life. All Everyone that has kids, you know that you go through. Sometimes you just don't want to wake up in the morning because you have to deal with life. But uh, my Uncle Rufus really wasn't an Uncle Rufus, an Aunt Cookie. And uh, that was my, my biological father's sister. And she had a severe drinking habit and it was generational, all right? And uh, she's gone on now, but we never talked about the drinking. We always went to parties every, I mean, this may sound a little comical, but I remember as a kid growing up in church that when I was with living with my grandparents, we went to church every Sunday, Bible study every Wednesday. We couldn't ride a bicycle on Sunday. We couldn't play marbles. And some of you all might be too young to know about marbles, but we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't do anything on Sunday. All right. But on Friday when my mom would come or Dexter would come and, um, and take us someplace, it was like a party every weekend. And then we were like, I guess, chocolate hungover for church on Sunday. <laughs> and so um, watching these people drink moonshine. I mean, they're in New York. I mean, we're in Syracuse, New York. I mean, what I, 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 a, a six, seven year old knows about moonshine dripping off the off the uh, line into a, into a, you know, I'm, wow. I'm picturing my mind even right now of all these dysfunctional people that were getting drunk, high and whatever. And we're in the midst of that sober looking at this and so but we were never allowed to talk about what went on at any of those family functions but that was like a every weekend thing so as the as the ancestors when they passed on we would often talk about the parties and stuff that we went to and how this one got drunk and stumbled into the fire and how this one did this and did that but you know but when it comes down to the nuts of it you know we go back traditionally back as people of color it was our pride to make sure we talked to God and we prayed over our children and we talked to them before they were even born into the world. Not many people do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so as you're reading, you're reading to your child. Now what we do is we've taken up the concept of the Caucasian movement and that is to lock someone away and say they don't exist. Mm. That bothers right. me from a mental standpoint, a sociology standpoint, a psychology yes. standpoint. Yes. All right. And so we as 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 uh, as Negroes that made it made it better for colored people, that advanced it to black people, that uh, African Americans now can call themselves African Americans and they've never been to Africa. They now have taken on the transcending identity of the white culture and saying we're locking this person away or we're going to slide this to them and we won't. Talk Talk about that because it's a taboo but those are things that we now that are educated we folk that are edu educated now we should educate our children let them know that maybe if you address the issue and you acknowledge that there's an elephant in the room you might not be able to eat the whole entire elephant but you can eat it one bite at a time but recognize and understand that it is in the room there's an issue yes. in the room and someone needs that attention. I mean, some of it's comical and then some of it isn't. I mean, I remember my aunt getting drunk, taking me to the county fair and getting on the 
whatever that thing was. And I call it from the time that we got on the, that roller coaster, whatever it was, until we got off. I had to be like seven or eight. But she had the grandest time. Well, she did. She was high. I wasn't high, but I was reading Rainbow High, you know. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't wait to, to get down. So we have to address issues and we have to educate our children to understand that our culture isn't mimicked based upon the people that have abused us. And then when the dynamics come along, God forbid, uh, children that have autism and certain um, uh, mental illness, it's not their fault. We, we're born into That's a right. world of sin. So we have to understand, I don't mean to preach, I've already done that this morning, but I'm just saying to you that we, we've got to educate our children, and let them know that, yeah, we need to discuss these things so that we can better adapt going into the future. Because right now we're hiding things away and, and hiding people away and locking them away, whether it be in your house. Now, the reason Uncle Rufus ended up in a room in the basement or up in the attic or out in the backyard is because we couldn't afford to send them to a, a mental institution. All right. And so, I mean, it's very hard sometimes to discuss uh, hard topics, if I can say it that way. But in our society, we've dealt with hard things ever since we were brought here or were um, in bondage, those of us that were already here, you know, and we've mimicked the Caucasian movement. So until we uh, have lost identity of how we care for one another, we never left one behind, just like in the army or the military. You never leave a man behind. You always bring him home. And so we've lost sight on that. Now we give it to somebody else, give them to someone else. It's almost like our children, and I'm going to stop. I remember my grandmother um, took us in, she and my grandfather, and he passed on in 83. And then she died some years later after we moved to Florida. But I refused to send her to a nursing home. I get a little teary sometimes when I talk about this. I refused to send her to a nursing home. One, because when she was working at community uh, hospital, all right, and not the one from General Hospital, but the Community General Hospital here in Syracuse, New York, she would work, she would make sure that we were fed, we were taken care of, and what respect or, or, or I would say, um, could I give her by sending her to a old folks home or sending her to somebody else? No, I need to do what she did and take the time to make sure I took care of the ancestor that took time to take care of me. And a lot of times we- That's we, right folk over to other people. And I'm talking about me, whatever your, your situation is, is your situation. But that's how you build a healthy relationship. That's how your children see healthy relationships. I mean, Ramel remembers my aunt Grony. She lived with us and she lived until she was 102. They said she was going to die at 80 something. Aunt Grony was a, was a who? She was her own Uncle Rufus, Aunt Jenny and whatever all together. And she had all her faculties, you know? And, and just a side note, she, she had this saying, she said, if you want to keep your man, you want to keep him happy, you never tell him no. You make sure you tell your husband, yes, yes, yes. And she said, man, <laughs> yeah. Come on now. I'm the him. only one that thought like that. <laughs> yeah. nah, that's that's what I'm talking yeah, about. That's why they had them 70 year marriages. I don't yeah. think they make them like said, that anymore. Thank God. For 70 years. And she said, she said, baby, honey, when my back hurt, I turned to the side and said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And she said, my husband left here with a smile on his face and he left me with a nice check. I said, come on, Grant. Ah. Now that's why you look at Come on through, Pat. See, that's what sparked him up. He would look like he was sleeping. Come on, that's Granny. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's, he's, that's nothing but truth. Right? There's a lot of truth in a joke. Y'all know that. Yes, we do. There's a lot of truth to the joke. <laughs> that's that's a very saying. valid point. I mean, very valid point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, just the, the words that just come to my mind is we won't heal what you don't reveal. Oh, mm. yes. Yes. You cannot heal what you don't reveal. And I'm glad we're having this conversation. And Kim, this is a great platform to, to, to begin to destigmatize the conversation, mm -hmm. taking away the labels of somebody being crazy, you know, mm -hmm. saying it's okay not to be okay, having conversations, open and honest, you know, conversations and that reinstoring that the values, you know, Pastor, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's hurting this generation. The family values, you know, aren't the same anymore. You know, no, we, 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 we don't love each other as a, you know, as a family, good, bad or indifferent, mm -hmm. you know, it's very unfortunate, you know, you know, we, we're condemning family members and we shouldn't. And, you know, and, and to your point, point, Aisha, you're making some very good points. And I was thinking about my own personal life because um, with my auntie, 
that was schizophrenic, you know, the different levels of mental illness uh, requires different treatment. But my mom, they provided everything they could for her. You know, they did every everything that they could do for her for to have most comfortable life. Now, I distinctly remember that. But we could not talk about it. You know, it just could not. And like substance abuse is most, most of y'all know a lot of times substance abuse stems is typically it is a form of mental illness that yeah. uses trauma induced mm-hmm. most mm-hmm. of the time. Mm-hmm. And we I think that's what, won't I think, talk about it. I think so that's we try to self-medicate with the it. drug. I think or other, to other other addictions. You're absolutely right, JB. Right. The, the self-medication mm-hmm. comes with the drugs, the alcohol, to soothe shopping, whatever, food, shopping, whatever's going on. A set of behaviors. You, I mean, I think that's where we, we're, we're driving to because just what you said, and, and I, Aisha started it first because she said, you know, I didn't have the person that was considered the mental illness. I had the person that was the drug addict. Mm-hmm. But that person is probably it does have mental illness. They're just using drugs to cover yes, up the yes, mental yes, illness. Because I'm telling you, yes. a lot of people that have drug addictions, they're mm-hmm. usually coding something because something traumatic happened to them. And I can tell you, I know several people that, and unfortunately, um, it has led to them being on drugs and ending up with um, a a form of mental illness being diagnosed with a title after they got off of drugs because now they have to be compensated with a different medication now. Say you were on heroin or um, something like that. Now you've off, you're off of that. Now you're considered schizophrenic and all these other different titles because, because of the damage mentally and psychosis. Damage mentally, yes. I mean, mm-hmm. really, it's it's in, but when they start to peel back the onion to say I'm what happened saying, yeah. to yeah. that person, it was something traumatic that happened to this person. Like this person had been molested or this person had been um beaten or something something awful happened to this person that they didn't get to to J point they didn't get to reveal what happened and they mm-hmm. used drugs as their comfort and they went into it and they couldn't get themselves out of it so you know it's like a vicious vicious circle and then I want to go to what pastor said when we talk about putting in our loved ones in these rooms and I could tell you because I had an aunt and my grandma took care of my her daughter and actually my my aunt was in like you know now it's kind of different because they live in like houses now and people assist them and they live pretty decently now but i can tell you in philly and ramel you all remember you remember when byberry was out there on roosevelt oh Park, yeah you didn't mm. aisha too you didn't want to go there because you were strapped down um drooling over medicated, waiting to die. You know what I mean? So what happened is the loved one said, I don't even want to 302 you because if I 302 you, right. you're going out there and the state is not going to state is going to take you. And then we're not going to have any control. And when you're black, that's just going to be even worse. And I don't want to see my loved one. So let me hide you and because I love you and I can do better for you. And then actually, because it's less, back to Aisha, less resources that I even know of. And now it's another um, terrible situation going on because I have to keep them hit and, and maybe they have to go to a doctor's appointment. And we're just going to slide that in there. Or maybe they won't even see the doctor. You know, they're not really being cared for. You see what I'm saying? Because they're in a closed in environment now because they're too afraid what may happen to them if I do expose what's going on. So. I think also, um, in addition to that, that we didn't have identifiable people that we could relate to. You know, mm-hmm. there weren't a lot of black psychologists, black psychiatrists back when we were growing right. up. And now we're moving Good forward point. and you get the Jays and the Dr. Dexters and you're getting right. um, more of those people. And so yeah. We can't like necessarily right. blame it on resources anymore. We have to retrain our minds to go, okay, now yes. there are some black 
there are some people that can relate to this issue right. out there. We just right. have to seek them out. And that's a that's an awesome thing. So like the Dr. Dexter, we can say, hey, there's a Dr. Dexter. We got the Dr. Tina's of the world. We got the people that look like us that can start fighting for us and we can right. divert, you know, and, you know, we got peer coaches like Jay that say, hey, you know what? We got this going on, you know, or, hey, I got a family member. I just want you to be able to talk to me and walk me through right. it and tell me what I need, you know what I mean? Instead of like, oh, it's inside the house, don't tell her. You know what I mean? Don't tell them out there. Don't you go out there and tell mm -hmm. her. You need to be able to talk openly and freely about it. You know, Kimmy, um, moving from the profession of psychology to pastoring, because I've been pastoring for a number of years. I was pastoring when I was uh, when I was going to going to school to get my um, psychology degree, uh, psychologist degree, um, people come to me as a pastor from other churches, well, especially when I was in Florida. When I was in Florida, I would get calls all over the state and out of the state as well, but I'm gonna deal with the state. And within the city of Jacksonville, even Orange Park, whether they were white, they were Hispanic, uh, whether they were people of color, they would call to sit and talk with me. One, because I, I kept information. But not only that, they didn't want to share with their local pastor what was going on with their family member or whether it was molestation. And we don't talk about that, Black people. We don't talk about rape, where Uncle Johnny raped little Susie and now the granddaddy is the, is the and hopefully I'm not offending anybody, the granddaddy is actually the daddy or the uncle or the daddy is the, the daddy is the daddy of whoever. We don't talk right. about that type of, of thing. And then, you know, so when they come to me, even now with the finances or even with religion or mental issues, they'll come talk to me and they'll, and I'm not saying I'm this great person. I'm just saying they'll come talk to me because it's not, uh, they're not going to hear it again or they're ashamed. Not, their pastor might not even share with anybody, but they just don't want anyone in their circle uh, that no. they deal with to even know what's going on. You know, some people don't even know that people even have more. They could have four children and one of them have an issue. And right. but you only see the three children. Right. And then when they see the fourth child, say, oh, I didn't know you had a fourth child. Right. Okay. And so in uh -huh. Hopeland, four children. And so um, I'm speaking ebonically, but um, so I didn't even know that you had a fourth child. And so that opens up another exposure. If you're trying to explain, well, this child has this and this has this. Well, first of all, it's really none of their business. I have four children bottom line. But when you have people that are frightened to be able to go into uh, a church setting or be able to go visit a, whether it be a psychologist or, or, psych, uh, or psychiatrist and say, we have these issues going on. Can you aid us in helping us to lead or get to the point where we need to be? Sociologist is inside the tank with you. Psychologist is outside. Sociologist and they, they walk you by hand to get to certain things. Psychologists aid you to be able to help yourself. But a lot of times people are frightened to talk about any of these little taboos. And you know, people have these issues compacted on top of one another and they've never, they aren't spoken about. And going back to what was just said, then we then they're introduced to drugs or alcohol to try to, you know, cover the hurt. Right. Pain because mm -hmm. these people don't yeah. talk about things like we should, and so that person goes thirty years with this hurt and this invisible scar uh, from the outside, but it's very much visible on the inside, and they're hurting. And we keep saying, "Well, what is it I can do?" You know, well, sometimes that person just needs to be able to talk to be able to get it out and say, "Uncle Johnny did this to me," and da 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 da. Exactly. Big mama, and Medea and all of them saying, baby, you don't talk about stuff like right. that. We right. keep that in the family. I'm going to stop talking. Somebody else can jump in. But that's where the drugs come into play. That's where the, 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 the alcohol comes into play. And not only that, we were introduced with issues that we never were intended to actually uh, be a part of, um, you know, with the syphilis uh, um, uh, uh, trials that they were doing. With, with men of color, or they said someone had a mental issue and they would inject them with syphilis and, and see how the reaction was. Or mm -hmm. those of us that love Coca-Cola, when I used to drink soda pop, that they really know that it was cocaine in the Coca-Cola back then to get you addicted to cocaine. Yeah. Okay, and then so you got other drug issues, but I wanna really go back to 
the masking of the rape, the molestation, financial issues. Because we as black people, can I say it that way, Ramel? We as people, <laughs> we as colored people have never been one to jump out no building but not having no money. You got that you right. Broke before. Now we're right. jumping, that out. Jumping, <laughs> jumping out of windows and we're 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 asphyxiating ourselves because we don't have a baby. We live without no money. We know what a jam sandwich is. Right. <laughs> right. You jam two pieces of bread together and wish and thank God that you got them pieces of bread, you know, and wish that <laughs> in there. You know, so we are survivors. We don't necessarily have to have state. We, I mean, you've had the ribs, you've had the hog ankles and, and whatever else that they have given it's us. The to try to survive. Well, <laughs> that's a story for another time. But we've had those things handed to us to barely make us get by and we have survived with that. So we need to take that stride that we have to get by with that in order to deal with some of these um idiosyncrasies in people's lives and in our lives so that we're better able to handle what's going on. I'm going to stop. But I think you hit a lot of valid points, you know, um, mm -hmm. a couple things, you know, and this, this episode was, this episode can probably go on forever because this is a series, you know, this is a series and there's no way we can touch on everything, but this will be um, a continuation Secrets of the Black Family, because when you talk about molestation and we talk about the fact that, you know, a lot of things happen to people and the person um, who has been um, molested and you don't, you know, we have been taught not to even talk about it, don't even um, bring it up, don't even point the finger at the person that did this to you and that family member is still and walking around freely in the family and living in the same house living in the same house they should be in jail um they, they you know it's it's a it's a vicious cycle you know we're going to have several um episodes that is all going to conclude to secrets of the black family and the, our hope is that whoever's listening will gain inspiration to take away these um, aha moments and one, seek help, you know, because these are not easy topics to talk about, you know what I mean, at all. At the end of the day, if you struggle with something, it can lead to generational curses, you know, it can lead to um, broken families and it can lead to, you know, like he was saying, you know, it wasn't common that black folks was committing suicide. Well, it's becoming common now, you know what I mean? So something has gone terribly wrong, you know, where that strength that we had as, as a black people, something is breaking down because you hear a whole bunch of young people that are doing things and they're taking their lives, especially younger people, you know, and mm -hmm. it's very troubling that we're getting to this point because mental health is so challenged right now. And, you know, we got social media and we don't know that wickedness is pulling kids in and they, they're not even talking about it and we're not even noticing what's going on. So it's a whole lot of things that are going on where, um, the black culture is struggling and we have to get back to basics where I say, where Jay say would say family is everything. Like I tell you, like in my family, you know, um, I do a lot of things different than like probably my parents did. My parents probably would tell me, stop it right now. My dad is not here with us anymore, but I try to keep my kids really close to me because, you know, I want to break that stigma where you have to send your kids out and let them flounder on their own. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. Keeping them close is giving me the ammunition to have them know that, you know, they can talk to me about anything. That's totally different than when I was growing up, because honestly, they're different than what, what I was when I was growing up. But that didn't make me um, any worse, but that doesn't make me make them any worse either, because we're in different times. And sometimes you have to do a little shift in order to bring everybody into the fold, you know. So right. um, I, I think that sometimes we have to look at things a little bit differently, but not always throw away things that all that work too, to your point too, um, Dr. Dexter. But you made a lot of valid points, a lot of valid points. So before we close this out, because again, I said, it's so many things that we can cover. You know, I appreciate you, Dr. Dexter, and I hope you continue on the series with us because you bring so much validity to so many things that we're going to be hitting on. And especially this episode, you nailed it. You know, um, I hope anybody that listens, they um, know 
um, what resources to, to go to. And before we close, please give people resources that if they're struggling with anything, um, with their mental health, who can they go to? What is the first line that you think that a person should go to if they're struggling with um, mental challenges? Like, and I have to start with saying, I feel anxious. I don't, I'm not feeling my best, you know? And I don't want to give anybody a label, but what is the first thing that you need to go to if you need help? What should you do? Because it's easy to say, pick up your phone, pick up your pick up your, uh, your insurance card and say, um, maybe I need to call that number on the back of the card and say, that's where the mental health, but guess what? Unfortunately, everybody don't have that resources right now. Maybe they have to go to the pastor. You see what I'm saying? And talk to the pastor. Give just a little couple tidbits on help because help is everything. And, and you know, going to, going to, going to your, your local pastor should be an avenue that you start out with, with prayer, first of all. But then we need to have pastors that are not just naming and claim it people and wanting million dollar homes and, and I know and that's right. And find that. You you need someone that has has some background with um, uh, psychological values, understanding, mm -hmm. um, wisdom, and insight. I mean, everything you need is in the Bible, but you got to have some insight, you know, to be able to deal with someone other and say, well, let's go to prayer. So when you go to prayer, what are we praying about? And then I leave and I still got the same issue. Mm -hmm. So that's an avenue. But if you don't have the, the resources of proper insurance, and even with that, having someone with the proper insurance to be able to go to, to Dr. Whoever, uh, um, you, you, you're kind of hitting and missing them, whether you have someone that's just doing it for the job or they actually try to assist you in helping yourself to become a better person or to deal with whatever is going on in your life. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion would be to, to take that avenue. And if you're not a, a, a person that attends church or something of that nature, then, I mean, reach out to me uh, and I can direct you to someone in your area that will be able to, 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 to help you. Now, I know that we have some people that are um, Muslim and some people that are Buddhist and so, so forth and so on, but we can get that avenue of that interfaith to be able to assist you in that area. And if that's not enough, then we can get you to that psychiatrist or to that uh, specific psychologist that can assist you. Um, because I mean, when it comes down to it, everybody doesn't have the resources to be able to go to a uh, class A psychologist that can do X, Y, and Z. And it's not so much what they can do, they're just there to assist you in helping yourself. It's not right. anything that they can do to pass a wand over, because if that was the case, everybody on this phone call will be billionaires right now. Absolutely. I mean, I would wave my wand right. and say, you're a billionaire. I'd be like, Oprah, and you're a billionaire. But <laughs> this is so, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, this is so real and so prevalent to today's time. And as I said earlier, we're, we're taking on traits of other people. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't know how to steal until somebody taught us how to steal. We mm -hmm. didn't know about homosexuality until somebody taught us about homosexuality. We didn't know about drinking and drugs until someone showed us how that, that works. But when it comes down to mental health, you know, it, it used to be a saying it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes uh, one member in the village to destroy a whole family. Mm -hmm. You'll get that on the way home. Now, in today's society, mm -hmm. in right. today's society, it used to be a thing where you can, you know, the lady next door can put you in check or this one can put you in check or you can go to this wise woman in the neighborhood because you don't have any parents living and get some sensible understanding. I would love to have been able to say, well, try to find an elder that's near you that has wisdom. But mm -hmm. all the elders that I know pretty much want to be hoochie mamas and wear high dresses. They don't want to be mothers in the church. They want everybody want to be a little, y'all forgive me. I'm just a realist. <laughs> it's hard oh to find someone. <laughs> it's hard <laughs> someone that actually is an elder that will give you sound advice that still doesn't want to hang out with Lizzie and Cardi B. All right. <laughs> Now, if you can find someone that's going to be able to give you some good godly wisdom, then those are the people that you need to cling to because they're going to help you navigate through whatever it is that you're going through, whether it's mental issues or marital breakup or, or financial issues. They're going to give you some sound advice. But I just want to pose something. Hopefully I answered your question. And, 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 and I want to ask you all something. Why is it that we're so quick to forgive stars that has capitalized? And I'm talking about the Dancing with the Stars people. They capitalize on rape. Every one of them has been uh, 
molested. I'm not one of them. All of them have, so according to them, or they've been on drugs. And then we're so quick to forgive them and we don't even know them. We're so quick to feel, oh, I'm so sorry that that's happening to them. But then you got Uncle Rufus in your basement upstairs in the room and we're hiding stuff because we're scared of what people are going to say. But people are out there open. We're so quick to forgive them. Why is that? Y'all help me out. That's the people in the back want to know. People in the back want to know. Why well, I, I mean, stars yeah, people, and people of Ashland. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm saying you, 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 when you do say entertainers, because when you, first of all, if you're going to come out and talk about it and say, hey, I had this issue, I went through this struggle, and however you are showing resilience to continue on your career, I, I'm assuming this is kind of the scenario you're saying, like we forgive somebody that has, you know, committed a crime or admitted something that they've gone through, abuse or drug addiction or whatever, but seemingly it didn't affect their career, right? They're still mm -hmm. doing their thing because a part of us all want to be entertained and all to some degree, you know, not that you're just not trying to forgive Uncle Rufus, but we're told not to talk about Uncle Rufus. This person's on TV. Right. You know, this person talked about it. They're entertaining. They're on TV. You actually like what they're doing. You know, uh, like we're talking, you know, it's a little side note, but the conversation between R. Kelly and, you know, what he went through, R. Kelly who writes his music and stuff like that. I enjoyed his music. I'm not going to put any more money in his pocket, but I enjoyed his music as an artist. So I'm just saying that we are told not to talk about our family members, but we see that person on TV. So my little point of view, I think that could be having something to do with why there is a forgiveness for that. Hmm. Yeah. Entertainer. I think it's more of a, a self-serving thing, if, if you ask me. We, we're, <laughs> we're more self-serving than um, than actually forgiving because you really don't even give a damn about the, the star. You know what I mean? The family member, you know, you just know that you, you're you taught to, to keep them hidden. But um, and deep down, you love them as a family member. So you, you're, you I guess it's more of a protective mode. The star, I mean, you, you really don't give a damn about their asses, really. If you think about, excuse me, Panthers, about cursing. You're okay. You're right. Ramel does all my cursing for me, so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting. Ramel didn't, didn't let loose it. Right. I didn't, I didn't loose it. curse yet. I didn't, didn't let curse loose yet. I, I said, okay, Pastor got her muzzle tonight. I know, because she didn't loose. let loose, because I was like, I was waiting for her to let loose, but I, I didn't like, curse yet. This is a yeah. very sensitive topic. And I actually I'm, enjoy I'm, I'm it, Mel, because <laughs> I actually enjoy it because her combinations, the way she uses with adjectives and pronouns, I mean, I really enjoy it. Very well-rounded. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, so um, I guess we could talk about that in, in the after show, but, you know, if you think about it, the star... They're the star. I don't really know them, so, you know, I could, I could pretend I forgive them... Uh, and, and so hurt here, people hurt about, though, you know, it goes back to not talking about it at all. So if I don't talk about what happened to me, then when I start doing it to the next person, then they don't start talking about what's happening right. to them. That's the problem. We're perpetuating the stigma and the hurt and the pain and all the, the R. Right. Kelly ishness because, you know, he was, <laughs> he was victimized first and then not talking about that. Then he started victimizing. Victimizing people. It and he minimized his victim. Right. His they minimized what happened to him because now that don't mean a damn thing because his stuff that got put on page number one hundred and thirty-seven, and his all the stuff he did is at the top of the page because did you remember somebody did this to him? They said I don't give a damn about that. What he did, what they did to him, we just know what you did. You know what I mean? It don't matter anymore. So that won't be a part of his sentencing. I can guarantee you, it's gonna be at the bottom. Yeah. And, and that's what I was, and that's what I was getting at. With the stars, we tend to, not to take away from what JB was saying, but the, the stars, we tend to forgive them so quickly because oh, they're on TV and oh, they've gone through so much. And a lot of times they're playing on people's, um, you know, it's not the entertainment aspect of it. They're playing on your emotions, and they want the fans to feel for them so they get popularity, you know. But are they really sincere in whether this actually happened or not? You know, with R. Kelly. Uh, he probably was victimized in the beginning and he became the, you know, the later on because there had to be some parents that know that they were sending their little 13, 14 year old girls out to him and they should be going to jail right along with our, our Kelly, as my auntie would say. 
and the RC Cola. So I'm looking at more of the this empathetic part of it. And as, and as Ramel was saying, it becomes perpetual if we're not just we're not conversating about it. And this becomes a repeating performance of us going digging ourselves deeper into a hole that we're not able to, to come out of. And we're hiding people instead of asking, you know, for deliverance or happening to aid the person or just talking about it so that uh, if if another family member down the line has this issue, they know how to better deal with it. Because a lot of times we don't know how to deal with things because we weren't trained or, you know, we lost the insight of what we were trained from, you know, some time ago. The Inca Empire, I think they were the ones that had to learn how to read and write again. I, I don't know. I think that I know it was in South America. But anyhow, the time had went by so far that they forgot their translation of being able to write and to read their language. So they had to start all over again. And so that's where we are pretty much. We're learning how to read and write again because we forgot how to take care of our own. Mm -hmm. I want to offer this resource. I did want to just say, I, I, I like exactly what you're saying, Pastor, um, when you're, you're talking earlier about, you know, entertainers revealing and a part of the process though, expression, big, huge part of reveal, big part of healing. And I just wanted to add that um, uh, yes, you you we're talking about if we're forgiving them, and then I did hear you say, which it sound like whether or not it's authentic or whether it is doing it right. because right, which that does have something to do with it. But for me, I just say taking them face value as a part of the healing process because expression is a huge part of healing. And I was just saying from that standpoint, it's encouraging because we're talking today, this episode is the fact that we won't talk about mm -hmm. the, the illness that's going on. So yes, it's magnified because you're, you're, you're fame, you know, you're famous, mm -hmm. you're rich, you're magnified, it's all on TV, you still want your career. So you better do some, uh, what do they call it? Uh, damage, damage control, control or however damage. you want to do it, yeah. right, work. you know, in the right way. But if it's sincere, it should also inspire. Because as of right now, the mental health movement that's going across the nation is partly uh, in momentum because a lot of celebrities and those that are coming out saying, hey, it's okay now to be okay. I've been and struggling. You, right. And you can't, yeah. you, uh, well, going back to the college scandal, all those two months sentencing for 400000 2 or $3 million, that had been someone of color they would have not even thought twice they'd have been in jail for the next 30 years. Right, so exactly, it's like, right. It, it's like whether you're sincere about whatever, how, however, but I don't want to prolong the show. And then lastly, to use those sour great excuses. I mean, we can't go along and grab Mary and Barry back and say, oh, that so-and-so set me up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's what you were there doing. Anyhow, I'm done for the night, but go ahead, I'm sorry. To get I want to offer a resource because yeah. Timmy had asked for resources and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So if you're seeking help for that, even though, and if you're, especially if you're a black family, you just need to know there are now uh, black providers out there, somebody that you can feel um, comfortable with. And you can call 1-800-662-HELP, 1-800-662-4357. Or you can call Dr. Dexter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> How about that? And when this episode is put uh, out, we're going to put the information out, Dr. Dexter, so people will have you as a resource so people okay. can reach out to you. And also, you can also, and I joke when I talk about the insurance card, but I can say, always hold your insurance company accountable. You know, yeah. but when you reach out to them, you can ask specifically what you want. You know what I mean? If you say, I want a, a therapist of color, give me the names of the therapists of color and do your due diligence. Look them up. You know what I mean? Make hold them. And if they say they're outside your network, call your insurance company and make sure they're outside your network because you have to do the work a little bit more than just take somebody saying that it's not and it doesn't work or it's not in the network or so on and so on. Because I'm telling you, a lot of, especially the therapists that are um, therapists of color, they work with you. I'm telling you, because they want us to be in their, in their fold and they want to help. So I'm mm -hmm. telling you, work outside of your own thought pattern. Because if you don't step outside of that box, then you won't get help yourself. You got to ask for help yourself. And if you don't feel right with like your doctor, your therapist, then you got to do a little bit extra. But I think it always starts with like what everybody is saying on this platform, start the conversation. 
start talking about it. If something bothers you, start talking about it. You know, don't feel ashamed that you're not feeling your best, you know, start talking about it. And I think that's the first thing. And like Dr. Dexter said, you know, praying, meditation, you know, these are things that you can do yourself. You know what I mean? Praying to me is everything. Meditating, you don't know. Meditating is everything. It is so uplifting, you know, but that does not, I say this, that does not, because praying is everything, but I always say God does not tell you to exclude people from helping you, you know, because God put people in the world so we all can help each other. If you sit there, and I mean, I had an aunt that sat there and said that she, um, you know, she was going to pray, she didn't want to talk to people. I think she was mentally ill because she needed to talk to somebody so someone could tell her, what are you, who are you talking to? Are you just talking to three or four people by yourself, because that means you need to talk to someone else so they can respond back because something is not going on. But, you know, the conversation of communication is always the key. We shut down and we don't talk about things and then we want to act like there is no resources. This, that's a huge one for us, but um, that goes back to secrets of the black family. And I think that's a protective mechanism that we do protect what our culture actually is as a safety net. That's just my opinion of it. But I think the more we talk about, it, the more we'll come out of it. Anybody has any, any other last thoughts before we close this out? This was just such a very necessary topic. I feel like... Um, I know the younger generation, we talked about them, you know, um, the suicide numbers in young people of color, you know, creeping up. I also feel like they are a little bit more um, active in participating in their own rescue. So as those suicide numbers are creeping up, also are the numbers of those individuals who are raising their hands and saying, I am not okay. Like I am going to actively go out there and try to find whatever resources are available and I'm going to, you know, do something different than what was done for me or to me. So I hope those individuals who are listening to the show, you get whatever help you need and that you continue talking you continue looking for the right individuals to help you through whatever you need help dealing with because they're definitely out there but we have to be willing to participate in our own rescue we can't you know Mm -hmm. just sit back and expect things to just be different you have to actively you know find those resources praying is an active thing you know those are things that you physically have to be engaged in so i am so grateful to you guys for this episode this was a great one and i I hope that all of the listeners definitely continue, you know, fighting for themselves and finding all the help that they need. Thank you, Aisha. Well, this concludes Let's Chit Chat Sis. I'm your girl, Kimmy, and you can check us out on our social media page, Let's Chit Chat Sis, and on Facebook and Instagram. Join us every Wednesday for a new episode. Check out our YouTube channel as well, where you can see episodes like this. And um, always give us our comments so we can have feedback. And tell us if you like episodes like this, what we can do different. We appreciate feedback always. So have a good week. Um, again, this is Let's Chit Chat. Have a good night.